Welcome back to the Growing Band Director podcast. This is episode number 105. I'm really blessed to be here with Laura Estes. Uh, Laura is a band director for 36 years from Georgia <laughs> and grew up originally in Florida. Before retiring in 2018, Laura taught middle school and high school band for 36 years, most recently in Cobb County School System as the Associate Band Director at Smitha Middle School. Ms. Estes was awarded the National Band Association Citation for of Excellence as her middle and high school bands were selected on multiple occasions to perform at clinics in both Georgia and Alabama, and has also given clinics to future music educators at the university level. So I'm really excited to have her here. Laura, how are you doing? I'm doing great. When Laura and I were talking about her rehearsal strategies, you sent me a message about that your rehearsal mantra was craft your rehearsals for student success. Yeah. And you sort of sent me, I don't know if it's a title or not, but I wrote down 13 tips for like ways to clean a band, basically, right? Ways to get your band to sound great. Um, so I'd like to start with that uh, in a second. But before, um, as you look back on your time in as a band director, um, what are some what are some um, keys that you felt like were important to your success as a teacher? Oh, well, um, I just always tried to remember what it was like myself mm -hmm. in a band and how excited I was and how much fun I was having. And I just wanted to try and recreate that for the students. Of course, you know, looking back, I'm trying to recreate it with um, the knowledge <laughs> of being a band director and not mm -hmm. the knowledge of being a student. So I just, I just wanted to give them opportunities that I didn't have and just teach the kids that um, really what the definition of fun is, is mm -hmm. more like enjoyable and learning, sure. feeling like you're learning something. I also want to mention you're, you're sort of part of my superhero series, the band directors <laughs> who are also moms thing. It's <laughs> So amazing. You, you guys are all a blessing. Um, okay. So the first one you have written down is diagnose potential musical problems in the ensemble before they occur. So for young teachers who hear that, they might not have any idea what you're talking about. Well, I certainly didn't know what that meant when I was young. You know, I think that um, when I was I had my first middle school band, I mostly just checked for range. Um, did I have these instruments <laughs> that the score called for? Um, what did the rhythms look like? You know, things like that. I, sure. I, I didn't really know how to, to, to delve deeper or what to look for. And so there are just so many things that I missed and it, it certainly does not lead to student success <laughs> when, mm -hmm. And you can avoid things before they happen. So um, that's, you know, I just learned how to do that. Like, uh, you know, one, for example, might be if uh, you're dealing with a clarinet A mm -hmm. against a flute G for inordinate amounts of time, because that's going to be a super challenge for the kids to try and get that in tune. Can you tell us why that's going to be a super challenge? Because the clarinets are sharp on that note, naturally sharp, and the flutes are naturally flat. And so with the young students, they don't realize that. I mean, you're trying to teach them intonation, but why on purpose would you give them something that's so difficult to do? Um, unknowingly, you know, unless, yeah. unless you say to them, I'm giving you this piece because we're going to be working on concert G intonation, mm -hmm. you know, that's a little different than just handing them a piece like that. And so many young middle school band pieces are written in concert C, you know, because obviously, because it it lays well with the instruments and, you know, with the ranges for most of the instruments. And so I, I just didn't know to check for that. But that that's a biggie mm -hmm. right there. 
One thing that I think it's great, we're going to start talking later on in the, the session about the switch you made to Composer and um, and the background and some of your music, and we're going to listen to a couple of your pieces. Um, but people need to know that if they're playing one of your pieces, you're taking all the knowledge you've taken from all of your time teaching, and now that goes into your Composer side. So when you write a piece, you know, when people have played one of your pieces, they know that you've been there and that you know what those bands are like when you're, and you write it accordingly. Um, I was also thinking, you know, as you're choosing a new piece, um, think about like note inventory. Like, are there notes in this piece your kids don't know? Um, are there rhythms in here they don't know? And if there are, then it's important you teach them that hopefully before the piece comes up. Um, and there's, I mean, there's so many things on that, but just really doing your score study ahead of time, I think is a really, really, really important thing. But not just knowing the score, but knowing I mean, we can all know our scores and then you pass it out to the students and you have no idea why something isn't working. Mm -hmm. And and so you just um, over time, you just learn. I, I mean, I didn't know in the beginning. I really didn't. I, I just would pass out a piece and um, I, I I would just innately know that this isn't working but I couldn't always um figure out why and as a young teacher super young I would blame the students I taught you that rhythm I taught you that note well yeah I did and the students understand that they understand that note they understand that rhythm but why why isn't it working well, maybe you passed out a piece that was pretty um, soloistic in nature, or you're playing that same rhythm, but there's only two other people playing it in the room, or you know things like that, and you haven't um, accounted for homophonic versus soloistic, which is huge with young students. You have to be super careful with that. It's also, it's also really important that people understand, especially the younger they are, the more repetition they need. Like you might've taught it once, but have you taught it 10, 15,000 times? And that, that was definitely something I, I had a learning curve uh, that I had to learn when I was younger. Again, you know, you just have to put yourself back when you're that age and, and, you know, you learn, you learn. I repetition one of the other things you mentioned was choosing quality literature and i think there's a another part of that and i think everybody should would try to choose quality literature um i would add to that if you don't mind at choose quality literature for your students because sometimes we choose quality literature that is too hard or too easy or not right or whatever so what are some things that went into you and still do when you're choosing programs what are things that you try to do to make sure you're choosing appropriate level well, again, trial and error, but um, you kind of, I guess when you're choosing a program, you want to maybe tell a story. And so, you know, you kind of start with some kind of a warm up that they'll immediately do really well on and feel comfortable with. You know, maybe that, I'm, and again, I'm talking the youngest of students. I mean, all of this applies for all grade levels, of course, but at varying degrees. Um, so something kind of homophonic and moves along, you know, isn't super slow or things like that, that they'll just feel very confident on in the beginning and, and then maybe move into the more challenging literature. And then you could either continue with the challenging or then back off just a little bit into what the students might call more fun, sure, things like that. So, you know, there's that and building a program. And then also there's an art to figuring out how far you can push them mm -hmm. with the latest um, concepts that you've taught because you, you want that, um, program to sound as polished as possible but even that you know maybe it's a spring concert and you don't need it to be as polished as possible because your goal is to give them something harder to prepare them for the following school year so mm -hmm. that you 
start at the next level. So there's it's it's pretty intricate. Um, it just depends on the the type of concert that you're going for, and um, and the students that you have in front of you. I mean, how many times have we <laughs> miscalculated, and maybe not miscalculated what they're capable of mm -hmm. or what they should be doing, but maybe miscalculated. Are they going to practice the music? And then you have to pull back. That's happened. There's a couple of things that come to mind as you're speaking about that. One is really knowing your students, like not, not, you know, not only how they play musically and what they can do and the pedagogy on their instrument. I mean, there's so much to learn here, but knowing, knowing how they are as kids and how you can push them and, and all that. And you're right. It's a gift that you, that you grow as you teach longer and longer, but more importantly, or equally as importantly, I would guess I would say is getting mentors and other people in your area who can help you along the journey. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now, when I started teaching, um, there were only two schools. I, I started teaching in Key West, Florida. And so there were only, I mean, it was either, you know, for my musical fulfillment, it was, it was either coming from my own middle school band or the high school band, which was quite good. And it was, you know, I was just so fortunate that, um, that that high school band record was such a good mentor to me, you know, because sometimes he would come to one of my rehearsals and I'd be so proud. And then at the end, I'd look at him and I'd see his face and it was like, oops, you know what, you know, there's so many things of uh, you don't even know what you don't know. And so sure. I, I just learned early on that whatever you think, you know, there's, there's a bunch more that, you don't even know you don't know yet. And the more time you teach, the more you realize you don't know. Yes. You feel like you know less yes. and less. Yes. You, you mentioned um, in our communications ahead of time, a couple of things that you look for as well. Um, melodic material in all the sections. Like I, when I was talking with Tiffany Hitch, she said, I love me a low brass melody, you know, um, so that all the sections can get the melody. Percussion, difficulty levels, the fact that you're utilizing percussion uh, enough. You put a comment in here, choosing the right literature helps to prevent behavior issues. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. I think because, everybody's agreeing. <laughs> uh, so like, let's just talk about percussion for a minute. So this is something that I, it took me a while to figure out. Even, even if you have to leave percussion parts out for some reason or rewrite it, you have to find them very challenging rhythms. You have to, you have to find, um, that you get, get them on, you know, I'll utilize as many different instruments as you possibly can. I mean, that's why they signed up to be percussionists. They just want to hit things and bang on things and make neat sounds and come up with new things. And and it, it took me a while to figure that out. But the, if you give out percussion parts that are super repetitive, where the first two measures just repeat themselves incessantly, I think we can all think of music like that. And, and, and they're going to, pretty much sight read it the first time well they're bored when mm -hmm. you're working your wind players and and you can include them as much as you can I mean when I have to rehearse um sections whether it's clarinets or it doesn't matter what it is I always have percussion play percussion you play or your air playing or you know, you're, you're doing something or you're my human metronome. I, you know, I just ha have them constantly going, but if their parts are still repetitive and uh, that, that, that they, they kind of got it on the first run through or the second run through, I mean, you're just asking for trouble, you know, totally. with <laughs> behavior issues. And, and I understand this intimately because, um, piano is, is my main instrument sax is my band instrument. And in college, um, we were put on our secondaries for conducting class. Mm -hmm. So they put me back in the percussion section. I mean, it was so easy to fool around. And we spent 
we spent a lot of time figuring out how we were going to mess up our friends who were on the podium. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> and so I, I remember, I remember that. And then, and then when I student taught, um, the band had 20 something percussionists, one class when I'm wow. student teaching. And I was like, Oh no, what are we, all those percussionists? And, and, they were so well trained mm -hmm. and it was whoever was assigned. This is a high school. Whoever was assigned to a piece, you know, they got up, the rest of them sat quietly and listened. And I was like, wow, you know, it came from yeah. <laughs> my student conducting of uh, fooling around in the percussion section to com the complete and most professional opposite. So uh, I, I just yeah. always remember those things yeah i was thinking too you know i know some band directors like to have a kid on snare and a kid on timpani and their mallet players and their auxiliary players and they stay on the same thing throughout i've always been a big believer of rotating and sure maybe on your on your hardest piece maybe put the kids where they go but you know and i think it's okay to if you're a new teacher or a teacher who's just who would start that you're gonna get a little resistance just in the kids that would say well i like this more i like that more and that's fine but rotating parts help helps a lot with that too um, and you know, a lot of times if you're in your program, when they start beginning band, if you can get them to, to have the beginning band teachers start them on mallets instead of on drums, at least for the first six months, um, you know, I think that's a great, a great way to go. I also learned, you were talking about air playing for the percussion. Another thing people can do if, if you, if everybody like pretends to hold their drumsticks here for a second, just pretend like you're holding drumsticks. And then if you flip the tip around, so it's touching almost your elbow underneath on your on your um mm -hmm. forearm you can then play they can physically play and use their fingers which they need to play but they're playing their forearms and it's silent that's another way that that you can mm -hmm. practice yes. um and have them be silent too um i think that's great and we haven't even talked about the rest of the band i mean <laughs> there can be behavior everywhere if it's too hard and they give up or it's too easy and they don't need to try i mean finding that sweet spot's really important that's why i've always been an advocate of Try to choose music ahead of time best you can and be okay to change music if you feel like it doesn't fit the group you have. Exactly. And and just and and understanding that the group you have and not just changes from year to year, it changes mm -hmm. you know from month to month, especially with the younglings there in middle school that are just physically changing so much almost before your eyes you know i've seen conductors <clears throat> over over the years i mean it's okay to recycle pieces but sometimes they're on like a, a schedule where they recycle mm -hmm. you know like a four-year rotation or five-year rotation and i think that's important in some respects because the students there's just certain literature the students need to know they really really do and and you're doing them a disservice if you don't expose them to certain things but then if you look back over programs and the, at the one school and you can like like say for assessment and you keep seeing the same pieces in a rotation um it you know it may fit the group but you know, you have a different group all the time with different strengths. And even if you have a high school band that that they can just play anything that you put in front of them, but you're still going to have strengths and cool players. You want to look for, you know, pieces that highlight mm -hmm. that, that time that you had three bassoons in your high school band. Sure. You know what I mean? American so Zalute. you want to find that. We were talking about this episode you said one of your strengths is being able to diagnose problems on the podium and being able to fix the issues you hear as much as you can whether you have two or three months or you have two or three hours like in an honor band setting and i mean not that we're going to be able to get all that information from you today that's taken you many many years to to figure that out but i wanted to go through and list number a number of the things that you talked about when you're saying diagnosing musical problems in rehearsal, be efficient with your students' time. I think that's a huge part. I love that efficiency word because your kids know if you're wasting their time or if they're basically on, I, I use the word like being on the treadmill. Like if they're on your treadmill and they have to keep up with you, 
I think that's a that's a really great rehearsal pace to have. Um, so I'm I'm going to list a bunch of these off, and then we'll see what we want to talk about. Okay. Um, okay. Listen carefully. Teach the students how to listen carefully. Learn to quickly figure out the root cause of a problem. Is a teacher error or is a student error? Usually student error, but that one, however. That's a biggie. That's a biggie right there. Yeah. So the root cause of a problem could be anything. It could be they they just counted wrong. That's an easy fix. Mm -hmm. Just do it again. Um, the root cause, let's say that's happening, I don't know, measure five. The problem might not be measure five. The problem could be measure three going into measure five so you start to learn what was it that caused it was was it this the build up into it or did some instrument not come in or maybe it's a beat two entrance and what's happening on beat one did you mm -hmm. just get a strong beat one or is there a bass drum thing or you know did, did the low folks miss miss an entrance on a strong you know sometimes you can just fix something by saying i need a super strong beat one on that measure and then mm -hmm. everything's fixed and so you just learn that but some and, problems um will just fix themselves and sometimes and it's not not complicated either like you're talking about beat one and a beat two entrance sometimes all it takes is you have to tell the band you, you look you have to really count carefully the bass drum is supposed to come in on count one but we know that there's a chance they might they might miss it so make sure you count really carefully and then come in on beat two whether or not the bass drum enters or not but you know for the little ones beat two entrances are, mm -hmm. are difficult sure and i actually try to include them even on my point five music it's just too important they have to learn to count independently. And I mean, it's not my job to teach all the bands of the world that, <laughs> <laughs> but I, it's important. It's important. And, and, and it's interesting, you know, um, to listen to it's a cool, you know, melodic or rhythmic line to, sure. to hear. And, and, and so they just, they just have to learn. It's not, it's not always simple, just, just count, but, you know, techniques or to say something to your students like breathe on beat one, or you just teach them from the youngest times uh, not to breathe on every rest, but, you know, mm -hmm. especially, you know, just always breathe one beat before you come in, or just, you could even say in this passage, I want you to breathe every time you have a quarter rest, take a breath, because if you take in a breath, you're certainly not making a sound so and then it it helps set up for the next and, and i think it's really important you know you learn to think like a kid so if you can put yourself in their position and say how do i do this at the most basic level to be able to that's important to be able to um explain it to them because we forget you know it was hard for us at one point to come in on a beat too now it's just it's no big deal and so we just have to keep remembering that well if you think about it as they get older it's harder to come in on the and and then as you get even older it started harder to come in on the e or the uh right i mean it it's it's all the same um perhaps a compositional error or so maybe occasionally there's something in the piece that is not right that you need to fix uh, i haven't found that a ton but you know your music theory is really important a, a tip i would give people i don't know how you would quickly analyze say you hadn't done the score study but especially for young band, for me, I find 90% of the time I can look at the low brass parts and figure out what the harmonies are supposed to be. Um, so I like that you included there's a, a potential error that maybe editors and composers missed. I'm not even talking about a note error mm -hmm. or things like that, that hopefully your ear will pick up, you know, if something isn't right. And then, you know, I always would tell my students, don't assume, you know, if you know you're playing the right note, you know it, and it's not sounding right, you raise your hand because, you know, it easily could be an editing error. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the first clarinets have the melody, like you're talking to your band, how come you're overbalancing? You're overbalancing. I need to hear more melody. 
And then you actually look at the score and realize not very many people were given the melody. Mm -hmm. And then the instruments that were given the melody were are softer instruments balanced against like mm -hmm. your entire low brow, you know, so you might have to do reorchestrating or sure. things like that, or, you know, compositionally, maybe something also isn't laying well with, you know, there's some kind of weird fingering or a trill like on a saxophone going from a b to a c like that's not going to work without mm -hmm. a without an alternate fingering and so you might hear that something's just not right and you can't figure it out you know when that happens um i would just say to my students we're just going to come back to that i need to look at that closer mm -hmm. you know instead of beat it to death. Yeah. And when you say that you put the, the culture in a place where they, sh they see that you don't know something at the moment and that, that does a lot on them too. Right. Right. And right. if you make a mistake, you know, tell them it's a, oops, I, you know, then the, I, I shouted out the wrong number or yep. sometimes I would say to the kids, oops, Miss Estes needs to learn how to read music. Sorry. The next two tips you gave are literally a full podcast in themselves, but we're going to kind of brush on them today. Only focus on one or two comps concepts at a time, especially for the young kids. Be concise and precise with your feedback. Always say what went well first and then what to improve on next. Yes. I've also heard that talked about as a, use it as a sandwich where it's like compliment and then work on something and then end with a compliment too. There's always something that you can say to a student that's positive, always. I don't care how bad the sound was, how ugly, how offensive, you can compliment their energy. But, but you know, you just, you just always need to find something nice and then mm -hmm. say, but, you know, let's use a little less air or dial down that energy from a 10 to let's say a seven, or when you do that, make sure you're listening to so and so. They'll, uh -huh. you know, they'll appreciate that too. And, sure. and always make your comments um, not personal, you know, pedagogical and to the music, non-personal. And, and you and you'll be able to teach them better when you have a good relationship with them. So that's that's got to come first. You you put here at the end in capital letters. So I want to make sure we really get it. Always get to beat one together. What do you mean by that? Oh my gosh, you can't do anything if, if you're not together. So I would always teach my students, didn't matter what the level was, my, my level six high school band, or, you know, just whenever I do a beat one, you better be on beat one mm -hmm. and, and, and that everything else will then fall into place. You know, I would tell my kids, you can play all the right notes, but if they're at all the wrong times, it's just a bunch of wrong. Yeah, and, and I, I think one of the one of the ways that happens a lot, I have a, a lot of students who do this, they might mess up one beat of a rhythm, but they play the rest of it perfectly. Well, if you go forward, they've played four measures, one beat late or one beat early. Exactly, that, a yeah. bunch of right notes at the wrong time. And so I, I actually teach my students we play through beat ones, you know, I just, just call it beat ones. We're going to play every beat one and you go through a piece super fast. You can mm -hmm. cycle like that so that they can hear you. You could, you could do it as quarter notes. You could do it as long notes. Okay. Here's measure one, measure two, measure three, you know, just, just go in order like that. If the kids can hear, this is what each beat one sounds like. Interesting. And they know when they're off. And, and I also would teach them along those lines, if they get ahead or behind, instead of trying to catch up or slow down, they just need to stop mm -hmm. and jump to the next beat one. I just always find beat one because once everything is lining up vertically, then all the right notes fall into place. A lot easier. You can, you can, I mean, it, it it's it's almost like magic. You know, there's so many things you don't have to say 
if they can all get to be one, then they, they can do a lot of fixing on their own. Next, I'm really excited to get into your story about how you were a band director for so long, and then all of a sudden you say you didn't burn out. You just decided to try a new career venture, which is as a composer. Um, so what was that story like? You know, so many people think, oh, did you always want to become a composer? And you finally realized a dream. And that was um, never ever a thought. In fact, I had a weird composing experience in high school. My best friend turned out to be a wonderful composer. She has her doctorate in theory and comp. And she's been a composer for many years, <clears throat> but she was already composing in high school. And so I thought I'd try my hand at it. And I wrote a little something that I was very proud of. And I said, here, take a look at this. And 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 she, I played it for her and she looked right at me. And she goes, that's Eleanor Rigby. And I said, no, it's not. And I knew it was, you know, mostly Eleanor Rigby. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, it just was never a thought of mine. You know, I always um, reorchestrated things at will, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in do do whatever you have to do to make your band sound right. You know, if you have to rebound mm -hmm. something, reorchestrate something. But that that's that was the extent of what I did. And then um, what turned out to be my final year of teaching, we were doing a superhero themed concert. I happened to have sixteen double reads and I was like how often can you have that so I'm looking for superhero things I mean I knew I wasn't going to find anything because it's hard to find anything for a double read ensemble and so I thought okay I'll write something and I downloaded note flight but what you also have to understand is the last several years of my teaching as more um, music writing software was was available. I mean, I, I just didn't want to learn it. I was like, I think I'm going to retire before I ever have to learn something like that. So I'm not even going to, my brain can only hold so much, you know, so I'm, I'm not even going to try to put that in my brain. Well, so I downloaded Note Flight and, and I wrote, you know, arranged a piece, you know, for my double read ensemble, which I'm not going to say what it is because I'm sure I broke copyright sure. rules and and um, it was a big hit and it was a piece that was the opposite of what you would ever think double reads would do and I realized I might have a talent for mm -hmm. this and this was very late in the school year I mean it was a spring concert and, and then I made, I was, I, I'm not a person that takes leaps of faith. You know, I, I had never really done anything like that. And it was year 36. And I thought, you know, my, my cousin asked me the question, she goes, what is going to be different this year than next year, if you want to do this? And the answer was like, nothing. It'll just be me getting started a year later. Mm -hmm. I thought I can always go back to teaching. I can always you know, get another school. And so I turned in my resignation and, and began composing. You said the first two pieces you, you sent in were accepted the first one within an hour. And, uh, that's pretty <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I, I, um, <clears throat> you know, I just thought maybe I'll write some marches, you know, I like marches and there's a formula and I thought, okay, I'll do that. So, so my first piece was Kvetcher's um, Surprises in Controversial Time. I just thought, I'm going to write, I love marches, but it's like the opposite of a march. It's like an mm -hmm. anti-march. It's like, um, there are no horn offbeats. There's time, there are some time changes just, just to throw people off. You know, mm -hmm. it starts out with trombone glissando and, you know, things like that. And, and so I, I submitted it on Halloween day of 2019 and then within the hour I, I mean when I pushed send I thought either I'm never going to hear back or I'll hear back with a rejection my whole goal was maybe someday some band will be nice enough to play 
this one piece one time Mm -hmm. and and they accepted it and so then that night i was like well if they like the first one, then I'll I'll just go ahead and submit the second one, which was a traditional march, both level two, and and they accepted it, and so that's so awesome. I'm very thankful to Excelsia and Larry Clark and Tyler R. Carey. Oh my gosh, they yep. they've been great. That's awesome. And you write that your mission is to write quality literature, no pandering down to the younglings. What do you mean by that? It it I don't think it's as prevalent now because there's there's so much wonderful new fresh writing over the last few years but for most of my career it was just really hard to find music for the youngest students that didn't Mm -hmm. sound like somebody wrote it harder and then they they tried to make it easier Mm -hmm. like really easier or some weird melody that just keeps repeating ad nauseum and you know boring parts and it was just always hard to find quality music that was super geared for that grade level those youngest Mm -hmm. levels and and that's what I wanted like my bassoons would come up to me how come we have to be with the tubas all the time (laughs) And I'd be like, you don't, don't. Know. you don't, you don't. And so, you know, think, things like that. Sure. Um, and then the second part you wrote, I just want to mention to write engaging literature for all instrument sections, especially the voice, the low voices and percussion. Um, so, mm-hmm. so next, what we're going to get to is listening to a little bit of your music. And again, I want to thank very much Excelsior Music and Mark Custom Recording for allowing us to use this music. First, I wanted to mention earlier this summer, um, we did a bunch of repertoire list. We did a big repertoire list in like, I think it was six or seven different parts. And I know we, we featured at least one of your pieces. We did 0.5 as a beginning band piece. I don't know if we did any more, but it was at least one. That's when I kind of started really learning about your music. Oh, um, yeah. And so what we're going to do is show people a couple pieces of yours that we want to, we want to highlight. Um, first, let's talk about Cook Straight Crossing. What's the story behind that piece? Oh, well, I was researching and I came upon New Zealand. I thought, Let's find out about New Zealand and and I um can I give you a fun fact? Yeah. My great grandfather was the prime minister of New Zealand in the 1920s. No. Isn't that what? awesome? Yeah. I've I've never been there but he was like, yeah. So anyways, and my great grandmother worked for the my grandmother worked for the embassy before she moved to the United States. She was like she was the one ready to press the button to like explode the place if she had to. <laughs> Oh my gosh. She was amazing. I love that lady. Anyway, sorry. I, I digress. That, that is that is so cool. That is so cool. Well, I didn't know anything about New Zealand. And so I just started reading about the culture and the history of New Zealand and, you know, some things with the language. And pretty soon in my research, um, you know, I know it's surrounded by water. And I came across that that devastating um, ferry, passenger ferry called the Wahini that sank in 1968. And it seems like ancient history, but, you know, 1968, I, I was nine years old. And, but but I don't I don't remember any anything, any news about that passenger ferry. So it just struck me as a, just a wonderful story. It, it it just affected me. And so. Do you know what the word Wahine means? I think female. Yeah. It like refers to a Maori or a Polynesian woman. Yes. Yeah. Like, like a lady. In, in fact, I wanted to call the piece the Wahine. Mm-hmm. Wahine. 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 Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you you see i offered something to this conversation <laughs> yeah no but i learned i learned that i've heard it pronounced both ways i wasn't sure but mm-hmm. thank you for telling me that it happened on cook straight so i called it cook straight crossing and the recording we're going to use um was by the mason high school band william mason high school band and actually i wanted to mention 
if people haven't heard it back in December, I did, I forget what, very, what episode it was, maybe 50 something, 58 with Ed Protzman. And before they went out, I did a whole interview with him about their program and, and that they were going out and all that. And I remember them mentioning, because we went in part of that episode, we went through his whole program and what he was going to play. And this is one of the pieces I they mentioned. I remember that. Yep. I listened to that episode and I, I wrote Ed an email and, and I said, thank you. That's right. Thank yep. you for mentioning. I forgot about that. So, so what's cool about this piece? Besides the okay. fact that it was performed at Midwest. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> I awesome. know I can't, I can't <laughs> believe I'm so thankful. I still can't believe it. So the music that I find at level one, um, just doesn't have opportunities often enough featuring solely sections, solo section, solo person, you know. And so what I did in this piece, um, it's kind of broke rules. We, we, you know, usually in a level one piece, it starts out fast and loud and whatever, but I start out kind of slow in this. And, and then there's a section at the very beginning for alto and flute and it could be director's choice and and that's the one of the cool things about this piece so if you're playing this piece and you've got a dynamite alto section your whole alto section can can feature it as a soli or it could be combined flute and alto which in some cases is half the band and so they're not um so you're not dealing with you know kids being scared to, to play, you know, a soloistic type section, because again, you usually can have a lot of flutes and a lot of altos. And so uh, it just features director's choice on, on how you want to structure that section. Mm -hmm. And the recording that you're going to hear, the way that Mason High School did it was um, they started out with alto and then split it up between an alt, uh, alto solo and a flute solo. And they actually had the kids stand up mm -hmm. during it, which I thought was really, really neat. And they used the ship's bell, which is not in the original. Yes, and, and, and they asked me, can we add a ship's bell? And I was like, you know, I wish I had thought about that. And I would have written a part for ship's bell. So yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a good suggestion. And so I actually did research on the types of ship's bells and what are the bell signals that the passengers of the Wahine would have would have heard mm -hmm. when they departed and when they were entering Cook Strait, you know, what, what do the bells sound like? And so that's how those bell sounds were incorporated. But again, I mean, I, I, it's, it's not it, but if anybody does play the piece, I, I say, feel free to do whatever you want, that's great. Or, you know, with, with that, because I think it's pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to check out the recording and we're going to let everybody see the piece as we do it. We'll do score and sound on this again, thanks to Excelsia and Mark Custer Records for this. Um, I did want to mention, I mean, as we listen to the Mason Band play this, I, what, when I met with them, I was so Im impressed. They were BOA top five marching band in what, middle November, end of November, whatever it was. And then within five weeks, their win ensemble was playing at Midwest. Like to yeah. me, like the, <laughs> it's like two, these amazing moments back within one. So it's just such a great program. Anyway, I digress. Let's listen to the piece. Here's Cook Straight Crossing.
It's such a cool piece, um, you know, C, C minor, which you mentioned earlier, is so classic. And I love it when composers use the major four chord in a minor key. That's such a great sound. I, I don't know if, if that comes from a tradition in any way. I feel like that happened a lot in, in a lot of the early band music, but I just thought I'd mention that. Um, yeah, and the percussion. It's like, it's simple percussion, but it's engaging and there's enough for them to play. Well, the percussion, um... I, I was very purposeful on the instruments that I chose. So you have the ocean instruments, you know, the, to depict the weather, the rain stick, the wind chimes, the, you know, the ocean drum and sure. things like that. Then the other instruments, I researched um, what were the most traditional instruments that the, I hope I'm saying it right, the Maori? Maori. 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 Yep. What were the most traditional instruments that they would use? So there were um, the, the castanets, the tong, the gongs. So the, those were the instruments that, that uh, I found that, that most sounded like the um, traditional instruments. And then I wrote the percussion rhythms uh, in a haka the best that I could. And, yep. and so did you catch that? I actually didn't, but I wanted to mention that if people haven't seen the haka, it's the, the Maori intimidation war dance. And if, if you ever want to see it, there's a the rugby team from New Zealand. It's called the All Blacks. Mm -hmm. And they do it at the side at the midfield line before each rugby match. And it wouldn't like imagine these guys who are 300 pounds and zero fat. Yeah, it's, uh, I watched those. I watched a bunch of ceremonial hakas, wedding hakas. Mm -hmm. And so I just noticed they're mostly in three, four time. And so I just incorporated those rhythms in That's the awesome. music and in the percussion. And the the beginning part is like a welcome haka, the, the soli solo section. So anyway, um, I tried to incorporate that. It's a great piece. It's a great piece. Thanks. I, I, I love it. I really hope a lot of people do it. Um, I also wanted to mention if there's if anybody else is looking for another piece that's a um, that's a New Zealand piece. There's also Paul Murtha's arrangement of the Wellerman, which is is available in Flex Band as well, and that's a great. If anybody else is looking for a second piece, do this one first. But after that, that would be another one, one good one to do too. Um, okay, and we're going to feature one more of your pieces. This is called Center Claus's Rooftop Ride. Yeah. Um, let's see, it's a quirky holiday piece depicting the Dutch tradition of Center Claus slipping and sliding on the rooftops while delivering gifts to children. Features slow trombone, glissante, dissonance of a minor second, tempo change, a couple quick meter changes, and a grand pause. Lots of sound effects and a horse whinny. Yeah, I, um, the Excelsior asked me to write um, a holiday piece, and so I, I, I will tend towards secular mm -hmm. pieces. And so <clears throat> I did some research and I thought, well, there's this person called Sinterklaas, you know, over there in the Netherlands. And, and so I, I thought, okay, if he's showing up and he rides a horse on rooftops in the middle of December, I figured that was going to be pretty icy. And then he would be sliding and slipping. And, and so that, that's what gave me the idea. But what I didn't know was during the recording session, um, I was in the audience. I was um, real happy to be in the audience and they did the horse winning and I couldn't hear it. And so I asked, I asked, can you, you know, get the horse winning louder? I'm like, I can't believe I'm asking this, this famous trumpet player to, to do that. And there was like a, something that they all, they altered a sustained notes during that time, you know, those two measures at the very end so that you could hear it come out mm -hmm. better. But this is what he said. He said, in all of trumpet canon, there's only one other horse mm -hmm. I was like, I didn't know that. Sleigh ride. Now there's <laughs> two. Now there's two. <laughs> I just thought, why hasn't anybody else written a horse whinny? It makes me want to write another one someplace but they did an excellent job and i love yeah. this horse whinny um before we listen to it in, in case people need to teach their trumpet players how to do a horse whinny it's actually quite easy push the valves halfway down start high go to low and shake the instrument <laughs> <laughs> 
and that's going to sound like a horse whinny. Just don't press the valves all the way down or all the way up and you'll oh, be fine. Halfway, halfway. So the second horse whinny in, in history. So Laura Estes and Leroy Anderson are side by side here. This is awesome. Oh my gosh, don't say that in the same sentence. This is my name of his. Uh, all right, <laughs> let's check it out. Here's Sinterklaas's rooftop ride. such a funny piece I, you know laughing as I hear it I, I actually I don't know if you've heard of the composer Dan Buckfitch he is a, a famous composer and writer of uh, and teacher out in I Idaho anyway I digress um he he often says that to write music to make people laugh is the hardest thing to do he said you can write something to make people feel proud or make people cry but to make people laugh is so hard and you definitely succeed with that piece thank you that is my goal. I, I really want people to chuckle throughout the piece. So um, thank you for, because I've got a weird sense of humor, I guess. I'm a little quirky myself. And so I hope it's well received, <laughs> the piece. But I, I like it. Because, did you catch the Temple Block solo? In oh, there? yeah. Yeah. Tuba solo, you know poor neglected temple block people and neglected tuba people you know i just want to try and find cool things for them trombones i mean they joined bands so that they could use that slide <laughs> so for sure so anyway I, I just try to keep keep those things in mind and throw them in when i can so last question i have for you um if people want to reach out to you for either advice or to maybe have custom arrangements or commission or or with arranging ideas or writing ideas is that something you're open to absolutely i would i would be honored laura i appreciate so much having you on um thanks for spending the time um sharing everything and and sharing your time and your music with all of us um is there something coming up that you're excited about yes um i have two commissions going right now my first two and i'm super excited about those because Again, I, I just haven't been composing for that long, so I just feel like I'm a baby mm -hmm. in, in this um, area. But um, there's there's one commission that I'm almost finished with, and it's a full orchestra commission that's uh, with tiered string levels. Great. So 
that that's been taking some time and I'm, I'm enjoying how that's come out. And then I have a level one commission that'll be due, um, I think in February. So I'm excited about that flattered and grateful that, uh, people ask me. I, I did want to push back real quick. Um, that's my nice way of saying, I disagree with you. You say that you're a baby in this, but if you think about all of your background in being a band director, you're not just doing this for the last five years. Like you're taking knowledge that you've had for a really long time and you've built. So think of it as you've been doing it for that long, even though you're a newer writer, your knowledge is not five years old. I do agree with you on yeah. that. <laughs> I am that, that is, if I had started doing this even 20 years ago, there would have been more of a steeper learning curve even then. But yeah, you, you're right. You're right. The, the experience of teaching all of my students all of these years, because when I'm writing something, I, I can immediately think back on a band or mm -hmm. a person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely a, a person or, you know, somebody having trouble with something. I'm like, oh, don't write it like that again or something. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. You're right. Thank you. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.